Hello, hello everybody. It's three o'clock. Thank you guys for coming. This is our final big presentation after a week of interviewing everybody and walking around town and talking to people and mm, he's probably had a six pack of monster energy drinks so he's <laughs> he's ready to go I appreciate y'all coming here and I know nothing about this either so I look forward to seeing it but again appreciate all of your help in and being here and being part of this organization Thank you, Terry. And, and Terry is right um, we we love the idea of plausible deniability so Literally everyone is seeing this for the first time together. Um, and a as you can imagine, those of you that we've met along the way this week, um, we had a lot of opportunities to, to listen and learn about Havana. Um, I'm excited to share with you our first round of ideas. Um, ask for a little bit of grace. Um, everything that you see has essentially been created since yesterday lunch. So um, I might have spelled something wrong. You know, I did spell Havana right, so we're good. Um, but, you know, what we're really trying to do with this is we're trying to show you the power of a system, the power of being able to have a platform to tell your story, and, and to really be able to connect the dots so that people can better understand all the great things that are going on here in the community. So um, I'm going to jump in, and please feel free at any point. If there's something that comes up that triggers a question, just, just interrupt me. I'm, I've got... Lots of kids, so I'm used to being interrupted. So um, that's completely fine. Um, I want to start by sharing a little bit of the survey results. We launched a survey, and we had over 100 people respond to it. It ran from October 30th to November 10th. Um, and we just asked some basic questions about the community. As you can see, 83% of the people that responded to it were right here from the Havana zip code. So I don't think that surprises anybody. Um, it's kind of interesting, though, that we had 10% of the respondents that were from nowhere close to here. So this kind of makes you want to know, oh, what, who are those folks? Um, reason for being here, 34% live in the town limits, 26% live and work here, um, and then 16% don't live or work here, but they come here to shop. So that's kind of interesting to know that people feel connected to this community even when they don't live here. And we talked about that a lot. I think one of the big things that we really needed to, to constantly remind ourselves of is Havana is a place, and that place is not defined purely by the corporate limits of the town. So when we're talking about the idea of destination branding, it has hazy borders. And the cooler Havana is, the larger Havana gets. And we want to make sure that any system that we have from a destination mindset allows for that growth and expansion while still understanding that from an organizational standpoint, the town limits are the town limits, but to a visitor, they don't really don't make a difference to them. Um, these are horrible charts, but I do just I like to I like to put them up because they make us look thorough. No, I'm just kidding. Um, well, the way that you kind of read these is the blue is strongly agree, red is agree, green is neutral, purple is disagree, and light blue is strongly disagree. So these are kind of ordered. So essentially, what this means is. Um, a lot of people think that you have a unique history and heritage. They think that you have a great place to live, a uh, great place for visitors, great community for events and activities. And you can start to see, it just starts to shift a little where it's like you go from being things that you're strong in and th to things you want to be stronger in. It uh, starts to transition. I mean, they still very much very positive about great opportunities for shopping. Um, it starts to take a, a pretty big drop when you get into a great place to operate a business. Um, now, you're also a community of 1800, so we have to kind of factor that in. And then all the way down to has great opportunities for dining. I think people are like, please, restaurants, more restaurants. Um, and then the last two, known throughout Florida and known nationally. And that's fine. That's fine. So those really, uh, overall, are, are pretty doggone positive. Um, Three words or phrases that best describe the personality, friendly, quaint, historic, charming, community, welcoming, small town. You know, we heard these over and over again uh, this week. Nothing there that jumped out. Um, and again, you know, you keep going back to this idea of the friendliness. And I definitely experienced that. Um, you guys, you really are. The community is remarkably kind 
and uh, it's not just the shopkeepers. It's literally, I mean, I walked around, I walked the aisles of Harvey's and stopped to talk to people and, um, and you know, when A to the L lease go, and, you know, it's, it's just, it's one of those things where it's just like you start to feel very comfortable there. And um, all those things were reinforced. Um, how positive of an image do you feel like Havana has outside of the community? 16% says very positive. And 59% says positive. So when you sit there and combine those two, 75% saying it's a positive image. That is very, very good. We have to remember communities are kind of like people and they have self-esteems. So when you have a community that had an agricultural uh, economy, you saw that agricultural economy wane, you saw it come back with this effort towards an antiques economy and a visitor-based economy, you saw that peak and then start, started to watch it to decline. To see a 75% perception of external um, of your community, that is wildly popular. That is very, very good self-esteem. So that's a great thing to come on. Typically, if we hit 60%, we're happy. Does that surprise anybody? That the That the... And again, I want, to, I want to be mindful of the way the question was asked. We weren't asking you, how do you feel about Havana? We're asking you, how do you feel like the region perceives Havana? So it's trying to get you to kind of step out of some of the, maybe the negativity and frustration that you might have of actually living here. And all in all, they felt like people saw the community very positively. So that was exciting. Um, what kind of businesses do you want to see? Top response, hands down, restaurants. Okay, so more places to eat. For the restaurants that are here, that's not an indication that you're not doing a good job. You're leaking money in restaurants, hand over fist. So um, being able to attract a couple would be a really good thing for the overall economy because what it does is it reduces the number of times that people feel like they have to leave. And when they leave, they're not just dining. They're probably doing grocery shopping and other things as well. So um, that all kind of fits in. Um, how do you hear about activities? We heard a lot of discussion about where we should invest our advertising dollars. But in the survey, it bears out that overall, social media, number one, word of mouth, number two, website, number three. I, I, I know that your demographics or your community are aging. But the fact of the matter is that adoption of online communication is definitely increasing across the board. And it seems to bear it out in the anecdotal responses there. How do you, what do you need to do more to be better promoted? Do more social media and do more on websites. So, you know, it, it does kind of reinforce that. Yep. Most of your respondents are from Havana. Yep. So, you probably, aren't you skewed that way then on the, on the Facebook or the social media versus TV where that's the, that's the people we're trying to get more to, to come to us. Yeah, but... It doesn't uh, seem like that, that catches it the way you got Well, so I think that you make a big assumption there where, first of all, you assume that the people who don't live here are completely and totally different from the people who are live here. And then... The second thing that you are assuming is you can't use social media to mimic the demographics of who it is finding out about you, but then target a geography somewhere else. Does that make sense? So it's like what we're learning about this is we're learning about how the locals are finding out about things. And then we can either choose to amplify that or we can choose to deliberately change that. But don't assume that just because the locals are finding out about things through Facebook, that you have to use a different medium to go in and connect to a different geography. Okay. Now, that being said, targeted marketing is a very, very big beast. You know, if you're an antique store and you're trying to target people who value antiques, then you're going to want to start to explore the channels where people are saying, I am passionate about antiques, so that your advertising dollar is connecting to those folks. Where um, I think a lot of times there's still this residual idea that advertising on TV is just really sexy. 
And I always tell folks, if you can't have an amazing looking TV commercial, you don't need to be on TV. It is better to be in any other medium than it is to have a mediocre produced video ad. Because if you're not delivering sound and, and moving picture in the highest level of quality, you might not be delivering the expectations. So it, it can be a little harder. One of the things that I'm looking forward to doing with the board is as we get through the brain re recommendations, I'll be more than happy to kind of hone in on what I think we should do with marketing budget to make the most bang for the buck. Because there's historic anecdotes of how you, you've used the money, and then there's, you know, maybe some ways that you could explore some new opportunities. So I, I'm not smart enough to say, oh, you should drop TV and go social, and I'm not smart enough to say you should put everything in TV. We'll work through that. Um, question before we leave yes, the screen. Yes, sir. Um, obviously, we don't have a lot of residents here that are going to contribute to the businesses and shops. Uh, we don't have a hotel for people to come and stay more than one night. Uh, that's kind of a question to itself. In your experience, if, if part of our goal is to bring the right mix of outside people in, um, the profile of people that come to visit the museum is very interesting. The majority of them are not from around here. My question is, what kind of uh, outside promotion will bring more people in? Because this is 84% plus of the people that live here. But if our goal is to bring in the right kind of folks uh, to come to our shops, to come to our businesses and so forth, I see TripAdvisor up there. What are some of the vehicles that we might need to be attending to if we want to draw people in, maybe from as far away as Atlanta, or people coming in to visit Florida generally, or the capital city? And so, I, I'm going to give you what might sound like a really hard answer. Um, and I'm actually going to argue some of the things that you said. So what I'm getting ready to lead into is market data, where we can understand the money that exists right here. Um, you guys have been pretty good at communicating to people that don't live here. And I would actually argue that maybe you haven't been as good to marketing to your true local regional customer that has the opportunity to be a loyal and local customer. Now, when you're a museum, let's be honest, <laughs> how many times is a local Havana resident going to go to the Shade Tobacco Museum? You know, it's like th there's not a whole lot of reason you are starting to do events and, and that kind of thing that is going to bring them back, but a museum is a different thing than a retail shop. So, number one, one of the things that I want you all to start remembering is the people that surround you are the ones that are going to help the businesses to thrive and survive. You have, you've identified there's no lodging. With no lodging, there's no accommodations tax. No accommodations tax, there's no funding to truly do external marketing. To be able to do a targeted market campaign to Atlanta takes resources that you probably don't have. You probably do not have the money to create the frequency and reach to saturate into that market and make that appeal through traditional marketing techniques. Now, what can you do? You can go through and you can start to identify keywords and geographies that make sense. And you can start to use things like Facebook marketing to target in and see if you can start to get some traction that way. How do you tackle lodging? Well, you can't just declare that you wish you had a hotel and then a, a hotel developer will come. Um, hotels are not the kind of things that, oh, we just need to invite someone to develop one here. So um, figuring out an incremental strategy, whether you're utilizing uh, bed and breakfast, whether you're utilizing Airbnb, um, cultivating a bit of that market. But to be honest, if I am looking at anything as a first strategy to help shore up the economy of Havana, it is we have to make sure that we are finding proactive ways to help new residents to the region connect with Havana. We've got somebody who just moved to town, and, and you know, she was at our public input meeting the other night. I, people that have lived here their entire lives 
would be good to be able to hear how positive someone who discovered Havana and decided to make it their home feel about this community. It's, it's this great feedback loop. We already have people who are choosing to live here, but then we're allowing this idea of retail connection to kind of, it's like, oh, well, you just discovered it yourself. And, and so we want to make sure that we've got a residential tie-in for new residents. We want to reinforce local pride. Those are kind of the first two arms. And then I would say, from a strategic standpoint, you have two remote campaigns. One's focused at a Tallahassee market and the message to get Tallahassee to come up here. And then the other is a Southwest Georgia, Southeast Alabama market. You're achieving getting people from both of those geographies now, but the message to get them here is slightly different. So let me get into some of the data and then get into some of the recommendations so that we don't get hung up in kind of the minutia of the media plan. We gotta know what in the world we're gonna to say to folks before we decide where we're gonna say it and how long we're gonna say it. So market data. A um, couple interesting things. First thing, we go to the U.S. Census website. We look at the town of Havana. Every day, you have 466 people who leave town to go to work. You have 37 people that live here and work here. And then you have 418 that come into town to go to work. So even though this idea of being a bedroom community is absolutely true, you do have a lot of people who only put their heads here because they're spending the rest of the day at work. You're also having a lot of people that are spending all day here working. And we heard this, Oscars said lunch is huge. We got people that work here that you, we only see them at lunchtime, but we might see them three times a week. Um, now, to dig into this a little bit more, this is where it gets really, if you're analytical, it gets sexy. And if you like pictures, this is like, oh my God, can we go to the next slide? But these are called radar maps. So. What these are showing us is these are showing us the geography that employees are either coming from or going to, and then the darker the color, the closer they are. So this right here, 455, this is the number of people that work here and live somewhere else. So you actually have a good number of people that come up here from Tallahassee. You have people that come over from Quincy, and then pretty equal the rest of the way. But then down here, that one over there actually shows where people go to, to go to work. So overwhelmingly go into Tallahassee. It's important to look at this because it, the anecdotes don't always align with the data. We were just working up in Michigan in a community that was convinced that everybody drove 60 minutes south into Detroit. When in actuality, the overwhelming majority drove 12 minutes west into Flint. But the small number of people that drove an hour south were just really vocal about complaining about it. You know, so this I think just reinforces what we feel like we know. Now, from that, I then wanted to look at what's called a retail leakage study. Now what a retail leakage study does is it compares what consumers in an area spend to what the stores sell. And this is the area that I looked at. This is a 10 minute drive time from the middle of Havana. So you can see it gets us down um, to the river essentially. Um, it's not really encompassing, it does take down midway, but it's not encompassing any big neighboring city, okay? Now, in this market, I'm going to go through this pretty quick, but there's a bunch of stuff that y'all can dig into later. Population in that 10-minute drive time is 8,300 people. So that's a little bit bigger number than our 1,800 that live in the town. Uh, 3,400 households. I want to point this out. When a category shows in blue, this means that you're underperforming. You have fewer than uh, the national average in this age group. So what are you doing? You have few kids and everything from 15 to 34. Everybody who's essentially considered young. And I can say that because I'm not in that category. Um, 55 to 84, 
you're killing it. You have way more than the national average. Okay? So this simply confirms what everybody has thought. Um, with this, a couple other interesting things. You have a lot more home ownership than normal. Um, so you actually have more people that are living and owning their home. That's typically a really good thing. Um, that means it's a very, very stable community. You have a housing stock that is a little bit older, uh, 19 to 28 years old. We see a lot of these are typically in the category one younger, so it's like 9 to 18 years old. Um, so that's not a big concern. Median age of householder, 59 years old. Okay, so again, um, <coughs> Couple things to be aware of. Let me see. Your household incomes are more or less on par with uh, national averages. Poverty status, you're actually below the mark on poverty status. Um, unemployment rate shows as being very, very high, but that's because you have retirees. So you have a lot of people who aren't employed but are intended to not be employed. So they, they tend to skew that number, but that's why you have a higher index on your unemployment rate. All that stuff kind of lays down this understanding of how the market here works. And then we create the best slides ever. Look at how beautiful this is. This is mind-numbing data, but I just want you to know what you're seeing here is you're literally seeing category by category business types. Uh, when you file taxes as a business, you classify as an NAICS code. That's your business type. And what this does is this shows a projected expenditure of your customers. This is how much the people in that 10 minute drive time spend. And this is how much the stores in that same 10 minute drive time sell. And then every time you see a red number, that means you are making more money than your consumers are spending. And every time you see a black number, that's a category where there is money that you can capture. Does that make sense? So it's, it's money that you don't have to invent. It's money that you don't have to go to Atlanta to get. It's money that literally exists within 10 minutes of our downtown. We just have to convince the consumer to spend it here instead of where they're spending it already. So um, there are two whole pages of this. And then, in addition to that, we also are able to do what's called a growth projection. So, you are projected to grow $16 million in sales in this 10-minute drive time in the next five years alone. Okay? So, that's a 2.27. That's pretty much falling right along the standard growth rate. So, it's nothing. You're not sitting there throwing a party, but you're like, we're not declining. And that's a real good thing. So, right now... Your overall market is a $141 million retail market. And you have a couple categories that stick out as particularly good categories for this community to pursue. You're leaving $550,000 in specialty foods. Meat markets, vegetable markets, farmers markets, and then what's ever considered a specialty food, cheese, you know, that kind of stuff. Not wine, but cheese stores. You're leaking $5 million in clothing stores. That doesn't surprise anybody. You're leaking $7.2 million in dining. And that is a mixture of both limited service and full service dining. You are leaking about... You're leaking one McDonald's or like two and a half other chain restaurants in limited service. And then you're probably leaking two to three locally owned sit-down restaurants. Okay? Now, that being said, like, I want to be honest here. You will never capture 100% of that. We know that to be the case. People will always leave town to eat, and that's fine. But... This is the same study that all of our national retailers use as they are going through a process of site selection. So this allows you to be informed in the same way that they were. 
and it allows you to work in concert with that local business owner to help arm them with the information about what market dynamics seem like for your, your community. Does that make sense? Any questions? Because the boring stuff officially ends and now we're getting to the fun stuff. Okay, cool. So, the current image. Quick question. Yes. The, the, the leakage. <laughs> the good news is you know how to find me. So. Yeah. The money is leaking, is it? So is it being spent somewhere else? Yes, right. it is being spent somewhere else. It is made, it is earned, and it is spent. It's just not spent here. And uh, just so you all know, because one of the big questions that people typically ask is they love to say, yeah, well, what about Amazon? Um, of that $141 million market, you have about $14.6 million that are being spent online sales. Typically, we don't ever cause concern until that number hits about a 12 or 12 and a half percent of the full market. And you're sitting squarely at 10 percent, which is standard across the board. So um, it does have online sales as part of this whole stuff. So you can dig into that. So current image, we come into the community. We see some of the things that exist. You've got a couple different gateway signs. Couple different looks going on there. When you see town vehicles, you see this uh, this little crest seal down here. We've got a Main Street logo that's relatively new. We've got the town of Havana um, logo that is a sign, but the sign doesn't exist, which that's always fun. It's like, oh, look at the sign of the town that doesn't actually have that sign anywhere. Um, and then you have the Havana Merchants Association logo, which is a good logo, but when you look at the colors, like the first thing that I thought when I saw the logo was, oh, that must not be Havana, Florida. That's, that must be the other Havana. Um, and just because the colors were so bright and vibrant and, and, you know, so I was like, oh, okay. So um, there's nothing here that's bad. There's some good stuff here. It's just not connected in any way, shape, or form. Um, you don't even have connection from gateway side to gateway side. So everything is kind of designed in a vacuum and designed as needed. So what we want to do is we want to start with a foundation so that every time we identify the need to communicate, we're now not starting from scratch, but instead we have a springboard to be able to tell that story from. Now, the other thing that we heard was we heard this very, very clear delineation. First of all, you're a pretty young community. I know people have been farming here since 1820s, but incorporated in 1906. Um, you've got this shade tobacco and agrarian culture that was what started you. You had it kind of fade away. It was replaced in the 80s by this antiques culture. And now the question that I heard people asking is, what's next? But I have to be honest, I'm not sure that's the right answer or the right question to ask. The, the right question for us to really think about is, what are the values and attributes of this community that remain consistent during our duration? When you have a community where every meeting that you have, you have somebody who says, I'm fifth generation. Fifth generation, it, there's something that is keeping people here. There is a gravitational force that is keeping people connected. And that gravitational force is the thing that we want to preserve. And if we can focus on preserving that, we're then, then allowing the passionate entrepreneurs and risk takers to determine for themselves what their new economy will be. We don't need a collective theme of businesses to create that new economy. We need to have an openness to receive that next wave of risk takers. Does that make sense? Okay. So from there, one of the biggest challenges is you have two names that are misnomers, you know? You are not Havana, Cuba, and you are not the Florida that people think of when you think of Florida. So it's almost like your identity is, it creates a little confusion. Um, there was some messaging that came out of Gadsden County that used the term unspoiled, unexpected. And it's like, well, unexpected is the nice way to say misunderstood. And, um, I always try to think about what communities I've worked in that share similar 
frustrations. And I was telling some folks on Tuesday, we did the branding for Hollister, California. And if you've ever been to a mall, you might have seen a Hollister, California store, which is like a traditional California surf shop. But Hollister, California is an agrarian community. Their high school mascot is the hay baler. They're nowhere near the beach. And in addition to that, the Abercrombie & Fitch Company owns the trademark for Hollister, California, so this poor community can't even make t-shirts with their own name on it. They literally were sued by this corporation for making shirts that said Hollister, California on it. So that was one thing that feels a little similar. The other was when we were doing branding work in Southwest Virginia, and everybody always thought that Southwest Virginia was South West Virginia. There's a big difference between being Virginia and West Virginia. So um, trying to identify those challenges and understanding that when you tell somebody, I'm from Havana, Florida, that doesn't provide clarity. And that's actually a huge opportunity for us. The understood misunderstanding is our opportunity for storytelling. It is the hook that allows us to explain who we are, where we are, and why we're special. So that's where, to me, it's pretty exciting. Um, let's see. The other thing that I really want to reinforce here is this idea that we need to understand that the community needs a branding toolkit. That branding toolkit has a destination brand that is shared by all. And then it has organization brands for these organizations. The problem is a lot of times what ends up happening is one group will go through this branding process. Let's say it's the town government. Well, guess what? When it's done, the town government adopts it, and then the town government and their elected officials do something that makes people upset. And then the business community doesn't want to use the brand because they're mad at the town. It's the same thing as colleges and universities where they have an academic logo and an athletic logo. We need to make sure that we have a shared brand for the whole community and its business community to use. And then we need to have these clear organizational identities. Now, before I jump into design recommendations, I wanted to point out, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I want to point out some quick things that um, I heard and saw and I wanted to highlight. One of the big things that we heard was pedestrian connectivity between East and West Main Street and your downtown. You have a highway that runs right through the middle. Um, with, there's a little bit of talk about working with FDOT and a road diet. I absolutely think, having walked it myself, that if you were to be able to get some bump outs and, and be able to narrow that length of pedestrian walkway between the two, it's not that uncomfortable, but if you could do that, that would make a huge difference. Being real creative with gestures throughout there, these are the tactile strips that are on crosswalks for um, for visually impaired folks, simply taking that and turning it into a welcome map. Using visual art and vertical murals in our crosswalks, so now you've introduced murals into the community, you now introduce the art into the crosswalk and the color and vibrancy in the roadway slows the traffic down. Uh, these are very, very popular. We're seeing a lot of these. Um, I always put this in there. This is, this is one of those 3D um, artists. We, ha we had a community that was really, really upset with how quick the trucks were driving through their downtown. So they got, they got one of these perspective artists, and they literally went out and they drew a picture of a girl running across the street. So as you drove, it looked like there was a girl in the middle of the street. And then it was kind of interesting because you could watch how many cars slowed down and how many sped up. So um, oh, God. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, Anytime that you can use art, and I think that you've done great things with murals. Murals, you have to remember, you don't have to love them all. Um, public art is, is a, a collection of tastes. One of the big things that I will say is there's a new material out there. I think it's called a Lumicore. It allows you to print directly on it and then adhere it to the side of a building without causing any damage to the building. You can stick it directly to brick. The texture of the brick shows through. Uh, it's very low cost, and one of the cool things about it is it allows for you to be able to blow up art and print it out digitally so that you don't always have to have a muralist to make these things reality. We see a lot of communities that are taking historic postcards and things like that and blowing it up that way. So um, keep using that creative, um, creative use of art throughout the community. The second thing that really stuck out to me 
is I, I hope that I hope that you can kind of process this. You all literally decided to fight nature. You decided that you were going to grow crops that needed you to build structures over the entire fields. I've been doing this for 20 years. I, I come from an agrarian uh, family that has lived on the same land in South Carolina since 1740. I had no clue that there was any kind of, of agriculture that worked like this. It, it is so counterintuitive to the way that you think of things being done. I think that you ought to take that storyline and not only are you telling it through the museum, but you take that idea of these shade structures and you start to reintroduce that all throughout your downtown. Whether you're doing canopies over certain streetways, whether you're doing canopies over uh, alleys, make it creative, make it artistic, but take advantage of that storyline that you already have. Um, Making things intriguing. I know that's, those are cool noodles. Um, that this community wanted to figure out a way. They wanted people to start using this alleyway because they were doing construction. So they put up these pool noodles and people literally could not walk by without going through there. Now, my wife, as I said, I'm not, we've got five kids. So my wife's like, no, you don't walk through there. That's where lice lives. But, you know, to, to everybody else, they're like, look at how fun this is. Um, Another thing pointing out, this is over in Gulfport, Mississippi. They took a service alley behind three or four different restaurants, called it Fishbone Alley. They went through and completely redesigned it. It's got art. It's got, they, they created collective garbage um, and grass, I mean, uh, grease receptacles for all the restaurants. But it has become this amazing event venue. Um, they literally, they have little block parties. They have Mississippi's smallest festival where they have this little event that just happens in the alley. So take advantage of those little physical elements that your community has. Don't fixate on the fact that a state highway divides you. Think about the ways that you can take advantage of the physical dynamics that you do have and make them work to the best of your ability. And then the final thing is you all have done a great job through the Downtown Improvement Committee, is that right, with the Facade Grant Program? And one of the big things that you could start to consider is what we call a, a vibrancy grant. So instead of giving matching up to $2,000 to do facade work, maybe you're doing matching up to $250 for anything that adds color and life to your downtown. Bringing life to the sidewalk. Um, this, this is my hometown of Greenville, South Carolina. It looks beautiful. Our buildings are completely and totally mediocre. But there's... I mean, the architectural integrity of the buildings is minuscule at best, but experience and environment trump architecture all the time. So being able to figure out those ways that you can just create intrigue, um, whether it's chairs, benches, flags, uh, flowers, umbrellas, bistro tables, anything that just gets people connecting, um, taking advantage of space. We have changed the way that we think about this in communities for the longest time. If we were going to put a bench down, we had to figure out how to bolt it down in all four legs. If somebody needs that bench, let them take the bench. You know, this idea that you have ways that the community can shape how their downtown is used. We have a, a great um, town square in Shelby, North Carolina, where they just put out bistro uh, chairs and every morning, the chairs are in a different formation, depending on who's there and what they needed to do with them. You got some narrow sidewalks. Uh, love to get a little bit more width there, but I always like to throw this in just to show, just because sidewalks are narrow don't mean that you can't do anything on them. Now, I will tell you, um, I probably would not want to sit on the sidewalk <laughs> as the trucks speed by, but it could be an interesting challenge, you know, it's like sit there for the whole meal and win a free drink. So, um, <laughs> Again, anything that adds color in life, anything that adds what we call stickability. Make your community fun, make it approachable. Um, this is one of my favorite ideas. They actually took pallets and they turned them into pop-up restaurants. So for virtually no money at all, you can go and you can turn a parking lot into a restaurant for an hour and a half. You know, it makes people think about things differently. This is Media Pennsylvania. 
they do an event uh, the first Wednesday of every month during the, the warmer months called uh, Dining Under the Stars. And every single restaurant takes all their tables out, puts them on their main street, and everybody just eats outside. So really, really cool event. You can see just this great opportunity. Um, and then the final thing that we all talked about was this idea of co-working. Co-working spaces are opportunities for you to get professionals working in your downtown. At a, a, it's a very flexible type space. Um, this is called the dugout. You essentially you rent a desk, and then there's a lot of open space and a conference room you can use. Uh, you have a lot of buildings that are big square footage buildings, so reusing those might be creative. You have to be dynamic in the way you choose to use it. Probably not going to fill a giant warehouse space up with modern retail. So we're seeing food halls a lot, shared kitchen spaces, multiple vendors. Um, this is a, a public market in Nashville. This is something that happened over in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where they took a couple of, uh, of containers and created a thing called Freight Yard. And then this is the Northern Market. This is in Grayling, Michigan, population 1800. Took an old lumber mill, and they're now turning it into a um, fresh market. So believe it or not, this stuff can happen. It can happen for communities your size. So. That's all I have to share now. Terry, we can go. And so, the brand elements. We always start with colors. And I wanted to be very, very mindful about the color selection here. I wanted to make sure that it wasn't too coastal. I wanted to make sure it wasn't too tropical. But I wanted it to be bright and vibrant. Okay? So, little caveat. Colors don't turn out as bright on the screen as they do on here. So, don't get too worried. But... What I did was I selected six colors. That's actually a rich navy blue, um, a light warm. It is. I don't, it is. Oh, yeah, look at those. Yeah, oh, yeah. I like it so, a lot better. See, so yeah, it looks a lot better on in, intended. It's a navy blue. It's a nice warm blue. Um, that's not like a. It's a powder blue. It's not like a turquoise. Then a nice rich green. Then a gold that I sampled directly out of a photo. Of, um, of shade tobacco, uh, a warm orange, but not too sun orange, and then literally pulled a brown out of a photo that I took of the um, one of the balls. All right. So the primary typeface is a pretty traditional, what's called a serif typeface. I'll show you in just a second why I picked it. The secondary is a clean, a sans serif typeface. And then the accent is a script. There are a lot of people that when they tried to type out Havana, they wanted to always do it in a script. The reason they want to do that is because Havana is a pretty name. So I get it. But that sends the wrong idea. Um, it, it just feels too coastal and too Cuban. Okay? So I wanted to make sure that that was a component of your system, but I didn't want that to be the primary identity. So... Look at how this looks. This is the typeface. It's got these really, really interesting crossbars in the H's and the A's that I felt like were really representative of the rolling hills, the topography that made this particular area different. And then what you see here is this is once I've actually customized the typeface. So all of the spacing is very deliberate. I've actually customized the way the letters relate to each other so they fit perfectly together, slanted the little things. So now what you have is you have a word type. So Havana is the same every time you use it. And that just kind of shows what the stock one versus the, the customized one. Well, why is that customized one better? Well, look at how much shorter it is. When, when it's shorter, it means I can get it taller in the same amount of space. I can say our name louder, if that makes sense. So then from there, we look at values. A couple things kept going back to this idea of shade, friendly, small, southern. This idea of just far enough, you're close to so many things, but you're also just far enough to be a place apart, to be your own place. You are a suburb to nothing. And that, that is a really, really nice dynamic to have. So all that leads together into what we call a brand statement. And I'm going to read that for you now. We are Havana, Florida. 
Our names sound familiar, but our story is unique. We are not the exotic pastels of Cuba's island capital, nor the sandy beaches of Florida's many coasts. But for over 100 years, people have been drawn to these rich, rolling Florida hills. Drawn here to grow, drawn here to thrive. Under our cheesecloth shelters, we grew shade tobacco something truly unique across our agrarian South. Our natural warmth nurtured it, our diligent effort made it possible. That warmth and effort are still alive today. From the halls of our museum to the pews of our churches, from the warm welcome of our shopkeepers to a cool scoop of ice cream downtown, we are proud to be Florida's friendliest small town. We are Havana. We are where Florida begins. You know our coasts, yet we are far from flat. You know our sunshine, yet we are known for shade. Discover something pleasantly different, where the palms change to pines, where the sands shift to fertile ground. We have deep roots, we have caring hearts. We have all the best of small town life. We are Havana, a very different Florida. That's good. That's different. So, what that does is that gives us this opportunity through the narrative to connect the dots of all the things that people were talking about. And it allows you to figure out how your story fits in without trying to force the community into a singular theme. And you can see it's just a very, very simple, we, we took that, that idea of the V and this kind of... Um, it's a, this sounds really weird, but it's a beautiful letter, and it's a great letter to have in the middle of your word. But you can kind of have just this warmth and this energy and this, this kind of sun above it, but very deliberately letters in, in gold. And that, that sun in blue, because we don't want it to look like we're trying to be a beach. Um, so with this destination Wait, brand, come back and let's see your, your colors here. Oh. Let's see what this is. Yeah, it's light blue. It's light blue. So with this, what you start to see is you start to build this system that's expandable. It works in one color. It, it has different variations based off the size that you have to fit in. I kind of created this ornate vertical element that feels like it's kind of tied into to agriculture and very floral. Um, but then you also have this simplified version that just lives in that box and just says Florida. But then from there, we need to think about those organizational brands. So, you know, we started with this, right? Of all the things that you're going to show to get people excited about this community, maybe not that perspective of the town hall, right? Like, it's hard to necessarily even know that there's a building in there. Um, so what we did here, and again, this is the identity for the government itself, but I still wanted it to be beautiful, and I wanted it to tie in to your, to your background and your storyline. So we created this really stylized version. It's actually inspired by a bit of the, uh, the cigar label shape. Um, it gives us that, that drying barn. Gives us that opportunity to bring in our established dates, have something that feels a little bit more formal, feels a little bit more timeless. We're not using this to market. You know, this is this is not going on ads. This is the kind of thing that we're going to see on vehicles like this. This is the kind of thing that's going to represent the government and their services. And then you look at the Main Street. Main Street logo did exactly what Main Street logos do. Guess what? Guess what? The name of the band, draw inspiration, draw scar, let's put a label lamp post on. Whether no matter the lamp, the lamp, the lamp, the lamp. You don't have to do that, okay? Okay, main, main street logo represent an organization and in the driving organization. It is okay to it to your your top top of the Thank you. 
nice, 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 all long, stylized, line change. Made out of four colors, 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 this is simply saying, saying, these are people doing things. This is not, this is not, oh, look at how point how point this community is. That's not the job, job of that, of that level. Then you start, you start to look at brand extension. It's where you take the colors, the height base, the components, and you start to stitch together things like events. So you've got your concert series. Again, very simple way to tie that in. Winter festival, take that rise and turn it into snowflake. Um, there's going to be a variation just in lawnmower parade. That is awesome. Just didn't have time to do it, but I love a good lawnmower parade. Um, even creating brands around some of those things like murals on main. Uh oh, is that a flood? Are we all getting a little bit? Amber alert. Amber alert. Amber alert. Um, so, being able to brand your initiatives as well, not just your events, stitching all those things together. Being able to have a design style that allow, allows you to connect the dots. You might decide that you're going to go out and do a product guide where you highlight products you can get downtown for the holidays and have this really nice, kind of clever way to, to uh, tell the story. Having merchandise that people want to wear. Most of the time, if you have anything that has your community's name on it, it's what we call a car wash t-shirt. It's so ugly that you only cut the grass or paint in it, right? So being able to make these tools available to the community, to the business community, so they can create products that, that people want, uh, being able to have things that, that people get excited about, being able to take the signs, I mean, take the brand and make its way out to a comprehensive wayfinding system. Right now, you do a great job announcing arrival, and then you go silent. <laughs> you know, it's like, welcome, we're so glad you're here. And then there's not any other thing else, right? Um, so what you're seeing here, and again, this is blue. These aren't black, they're blue, blue signs. But um, what we're looking at here is everything from gateways. You don't need to go change any of your gateways. Gateways are expensive. Yours look fine. So where you're going to start is you're going to start with these trailblazers. Trailblazers have three to four destinations. They're the things that are telling people, creating that seamless experience, carrying them in. Once you get into the downtown proper, you go to a smaller scaled uh, trailblazer that's speaking to the vehicle and the pedestrian at the same time. You can always re-announce arrival when the community starts to change, when it feels different as you get into downtown, you re-announce arrival with a pole-mounted gateway. And then using street banners, you've got some banners that are up now. One of the things that you want to do is you want to create a strategic banner system where when you go and cross over Main Street, you want solid color banners running down each side. You want to use that solid color to create a definite connection. This is one street. You want bright, vibrant, and busy banners on the highway. Because you want it to create clutter and you want it to create a frantic environment to slow down the traffic. So you don't just do the same banner everywhere. You think about what you're trying to do, whether you're trying to connect the dots, whether you're trying to slow traffic, whether you're, whether you're trying to tell people, hey, there's more to see. And you use the banners strategically that way. Being able to take advantage of available property, you do have a good bit of vacancy here. Um, People don't always think that, you know, if one business owned multiple bays, they don't necessarily think that there's an opportunity to just get a single bay. So breaking things up, telling that story. Um, wayfinding signage is really expensive. So you might want to go through and launch with what we call guerrilla wayfinding, where everything is either bike scaled or pedestrian scaled, and you talk about how far things are in minutes. These can be produced on corrugated plastic, and they can literally go off tomorrow. So it gives you a low-cost way to, leap, uh, to kind of roll into it. And then we even created some templates for kind of telling the story, how to bring the ads and, and kind of messages together to start to speak to other folks. So getting, there were so many different phrases, whether we were talking about rolling cigars, and I know that 
that you didn't do a bunch of that, but you did do some of that. And, and you know, I've got a whole list of, of different phrases that weren't good enough to be a tagline, but were really good to be able to tell different parts of the story. So then from there, we also want to focus a little bit on what the implementation looks like. So through this process, you're going to get a comprehensive style guide. It's going to define all the typefaces, going to define all the colors, tell you how to use it, how not to use it. There's also a brand launch guide that gives you step-by-step -step phased approach to rolling the brand out to the community. There's also a how to be a brand partner that's intended to be shared with the business community, with event organizers, giving them ideas of how they might be able to use these tools. And then finally, we're going to include a brand score score sheet so the Main Street organization in a year can go back, grade themselves, and help to identify the low-hanging fruit for additional implementation of the video. That's what I was able to do since yesterday. <laughs> so now it's your turn. I'd love to hear like initial reaction. Does does the overall uh, direction make sense? Does the approach and, and the the tools that we're that we're talking about seem to make sense and fit in? Or what are y'all's thoughts? Help me with the, uh, the wayfinding signs, for instance, in signage. Actually, we had that. We were going to implement. So if, if we were, for instance, town and us, Main Street, are we going to have the same colors in our signs? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so you gave us six colors. Yep. Uh, and so then we're going to pick three each or whatever? No, the way that it's set up, the town system uses the green, the gold, and the brown. Okay. And then the um, the main system shares the same green, shares the same gold, and then instead the brown goes with the blue as the primary uses. And then that way, when you look at the signs, the signs are recommended using the green, the gold, and the dark blue. So it's literally floating in between the two systems. It's using the word type that's shared by both. And the only place that you have to make a decision as to which graphic to use is on the gateway sign, which would be the absolute last thing that you do. Because you already have gateway signs, and there's no reason to spend to pick some. So I specifically designed them so that the sign would float right in there in between those two entities. And the only thing that it's really using is that word type for the community that shares the sign. Yeah. I think that, um, I want to make sure I answer that the right way. Uh, when you go through and you start to tackle a wayfinding system, um, the thing that you do want to do is you want to tackle it in phases where you're trying to do as many of the same like sign, sign type and size at the same time so that your money can go farthest. Those particular ones with those destinations were random and just brought up. But the thing that I would say is I would say starting off, the thing you would want to do first is the high-speed trailblazer signs. So those would be the signs that would go on your high path. What signs are those? Those are the ones with the three destinations, the larger of those. And where would you suggest putting those? <laughs> Um, I mean, because are we limited on what we can do on that along, DOT? Yeah. Along those lines, and I think it's part of the same, excuse me, same thought. Mm -hmm. I mean, this time of year you go down and look at First Street with all the lights, if you saw that at night, mm -hmm. and you go kind of, oh, well, I want to live here along. Drive down the highway on your way home, mm -hmm. and you go like this, oh my God, what is this place? And they're coming. The murals are nice. What are your ideas specifically? Um, I'm thinking highway. that highway is a big challenge for us, mm. maybe. What are your uh, specific recipe for moving forward on priority? I love your crosswalk ideas. Yeah, I, mm. 
the bright so, river, something with that narrow sidewalk that's too dangerous to walk the bound. Yeah, so um, the thing that I would say is, if I'm being completely honest, I don't think that the highway is as big a problem as you think it is. There are many, many communities that have highways that cut straight through the center of them. Um, the bigger issue is the fact that you want to curate people's experience. And um, from a flow and logic standpoint, if you have a person who's coming here who really has no itinerary, so they're following along to what you're telling them to do, you want them to pull onto East Main Street, park in the parking lot right there on the right, and then have them see East Main Street first, cross over, do everything on the west, and then come back. Because it's far easier to land them on the east and get them to the west than it is land them on the west and get them to the east. And so you want to have trailblazer signs along the highway. You would want to have um, probably three between the gateway and the main intersection on each side, I'm guessing. That's like a big study that you're asking on the spot, so I'm just kind of guessing. Um, I, one of the first things that you all want to do is you want to go through and you, you want to identify all the potential destinations that would ever be signed to and then classify them as a class one, two, or three destination. And, and essentially what that means is how many signs do they deserve to get to there? The way that we typically sign to things is the librarian says, we need a sign to the library. And somebody puts a sign to the library up and then the fire department says, we need a sign to the fire department, and then there's a fire department sign, and it looks completely different than the library sign. So identifying the destinations going through there. Um, I would cut down the holly trees. Um, you don't have to cut them all down at the same time. You are doing so well. In the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the holly trees are completely and totally inappropriate street trees. Um, they, they hit their maximum height. They cap out where they cover all of the sign panels of the buildings. What you want to have there instead is you want to have a tree that has a deep root bed and a high canopy. You remember the theme of shade. You want to have a canopy tree. Now, you don't cut them all down at one time. That would be horrible. Because no matter what you do, you need to have a phased tree strategy. But selectively transitioning some of the hollies for taller canopy trees is going to make a huge difference. First of all, the only thing you're dealing with on the sidewalk itself is the trunk. Trees and the branches go, go higher than that. There will be a small period of time where the, a larger tree covers the sign and then it grows past the sign. So um, that's a that really is a big thing. The hollies are it's a really interesting choice. It, it's interesting in that I, I'm not sure who would have picked it. I do. Because, like, if, if the people from Public Works had anything to do, they would have never said that you do that because they don't want to collect holly leaves. And, um, and then you've got, you know, your berries, you've got all the, the thing. And, and a holly root ball is not not a deep bearing root ball it's a root ball that fights up and so then it starts to disrupt your whole streetscape and sidewalk and, and um yeah. so so when you say do it in phases are you talking like one street at a time no 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 no, no. every no. other tree every or something yeah, i would like that? what i would say is i would go through and i would look at your trees count your total of trees in the core break them down into four selectively do every four and then have it on a on a um, like a 25% rotating so what, basis. What type tree would go higher than the signage? Oh, there are lots. I mean, there. Um, you can. They use ginkgos. Um, if you get the right gender, they use. Uh, there are different oaks that you can use. There are. Uh, there's a, a breed called Zalcovas mm -hmm. that get used sometimes. Um, I mean, going through and finding out. Now, the thing that I don't know. I'm not a botanist, so I'm not going to be able to tell you what's mm -hmm. best for this temperate zone. But um, that won't be hard to find either. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I would imagine that should be one of the things that Florida Main Street could jump right on is a good list of Florida street trees. And, and honestly, if you can't find it there because everybody plants palm trees, 
then let me know and I'll talk to Georgia and have, they'll have to do it. We have a few nurseries here. Right, right. Can they put lights on these trees? Absolutely, year round, leave them up there because you don't have to get, with a shade tree, you don't have to trim it up to look like a gumball. So. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Um, the the other thing that I would kind of think about is the west side is remarkably intriguing with the way that the streets are. Um, the the side with the what do y'all call it? Y'all what's y'all call it? Wander. I mean that that whole building and the curved street in front of it. Um, that area is really cool and really interesting. And then the I mean, you have this kind of like hidden Main Street. I know we were talking about yesterday how many folks come in traditions from the, the highway side and then don't even know that the back street's there. And it's kind of like, it's it's like you have a bonus Main Street. It's like, oh, surprise, guess what? Here's a gift, a whole other Main Street, you know? Um, so it, it's a really, really cool dynamic. The other thing that I would say, and, and I know that there are all kinds of logical reasons that it exists, but I'd also love to see the chain link fence around the, um, the planters exchange and the, um, the museum go away, and I'd love to see a deliberate pedestrian connection that's drawing people into that space that kind of feels like a natural and organic plaza space out there in front of, um, of the museum. That's a, that's a great space to be able to use. Um, you've got some really cool buildings that might fall outside of the purview of what a lot of people think of as downtown. Um, I love the brick building across the street from the museum. Um, the, it was, yeah. yeah. So they're just some really, really cool, um, cool opportunities all throughout the community. And um, and the biggest advice that I would give you is. Don't get hung up on the most complicated problems because there's plenty of low-hanging fruit. Like you could, you could literally decide we need to fix the highway connection. We need a road dike. And that is priority one. Well, you just pick the hardest thing possible. We want to shrink a road and do it in conjunction with DOT. Well, heck, let's just figure out how to reroute the railroad at the same time. And you've now created like the easiest task ever, right? So... Um, always be good about identifying the low-hanging fruit, identifying the things that make the most impact for the least effort, and, um, and then just remember that you, you are at a point of opportunity. You have to make sure that, I know it can be frustrating, some of the properties that are empty need to be available. And one of the things that I heard all week long was, Everything in Havana's for sale. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that everything's actually sellable. And there, there is definitely an overinflation of perceived value in certain circumstances. So if you were to have an opportunity for people who run businesses to tell people who are selling buildings or think that they know what buildings are worth, it's like, look, you know, your building doesn't have foot traffic, so what is it that, <laughs> what is it that you're selling me? Uh, a building that needs a new roof, needs uh, upgraded wiring, <laughs> needs to be brought up to the 21st century and still doesn't have customers walking past it? Okay, I kind of know what the value of that is. Um, so. That, that's probably one of the bigger things, but I, I just think that um, being willing to adopt the narrative, you do have some new business owners, you do have some young people coming in and taking risks, and, and it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, we went through and we had this big wave in the 80s, and man, we were riding high with antiques, but now we've got a lot of business owners that are starting to age out. Well, that is true, but you also have couple stories here and there that you want to put that spotlight of, hey, we're passing the baton. We've got some new talent, we've got some new passion, and and honestly, that's what that's what we need. We need some, some new names.
extension of the locals, mm -hmm. um, and is mentioned creating pride. Um, is there anything specific other than? Oh, I mean, you can definitely, I know that Main Street has organized a couple cleanup days. I saw that was uh, on the website. Anytime you do events like that, it's good. Um, anytime there's a pre-existing community gathering, being able to give people that option to, to connect, merchandise, believe it or not, the, like, the, the best way to build pride, honestly, is having businesses see the opportunity to profit off of how much people love her name. And, and there's a lot that'll start to happen just there, but um, social media is, is a remarkably good place. Um, going through and simply sharing some of these stories back with them and, and showing them the community in a way that says, our community is, is deserving of this kind of knowledge. It, it really does go on there. Yes, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, you can't ask this question. That's not fair for you to ask this question. You're in charge of volunteers. You have figured out a way. I was told yesterday that you have figured out a way to get people to volunteer to work and then thank you afterwards. Um, it, you know, I think one of the big things is, um, are y'all still actively selling homes and lots in the development? Um, if you put together a polished package, your sales office, it, I mean, gotcha, gotcha. Right. You mentioned doing more with new residents mm -hmm. across the board. Mm -hmm. um, it's surprising to me how many people come in the museum and they've never been. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, you get the point. Um, it's right there. They've been here for a couple of years, sometimes longer. This, this welcome packet mechanism, there ought to be an easy way to know who's new here. Packet and... Uh, we don't do a lot because we can't afford a lot because we're mom and pop sort of thing. Right. But it's amazing that the people don't know, and I'm using us as an example, been here eight, nineteen months, and they're a mile and a half down the road, they didn't even know we were here. They come in, man, where'd this come from? How long have I been here? You know, just yeah. by happenstance. Well, I mean, we could spend all afternoon talking about marketing tactics. Here's the one thing that I will say, and I think that it's relevant across the board for all those questions. Everybody in this room knows what the most effective form of advertising is. Word of mouth. Everybody knows that, but they, they rarely go to the next step. The next step is, what can we do to proactively cultivate word of mouth advertising? So, you know, is it adopt a uniform hashtag and then as people use that, do drawings for people to use it? I mean, I, I gotta be honest, I do this a lot. I go to a lot of different places. You guys have an 82 year old social media guru who is creating content and I literally walk in to Miss Melba's and she's like, do you know Jeff Siegler? Well, yeah, I, I know Jeff Siegler from Ohio via Pittsburgh. How do you know Jeff Siegler? Oh, we're friends online. He's my boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I get that a lot, but I'm like, so I message Jeff and I'm like, 
hey, here's a picture of me and Melba. She says she, she says she knows you. He's like, yep, that's my Florida girlfriend. <laughs> They've never met in person. They're friends online, socially, you know. Um, so being able to figure out the ways that you can cultivate people talking about you, um, whether you're going through and whether you're doing one of those, I mean, you all know, if you run a business, you know who your regulars are. Well, you love your regulars, but how do you give them, how do you make your, how do you turn a regular into an evangelist? How do you motivate them to start bringing more people in? Like, they become your investors, because you know they love you. So how do you figure out how to make them work for you? So, yes, Um, I need to look at the full list. Right, um, because when I was going on, I was trying to do it via the website, and the website rolls, so it doesn't doesn't give me that opportunity to look at the full list. Um, the, let me give you the general advice. The general advice is, I bet if we looked at your event schedule, we could find one or two things that is manpower intensive, that is more... Uh, is less a retail promotion and more just a special event. Um, anytime you can remove an extraneous manpower heavy event and replace it with a small, reoccurring, repetitious event that gives people an excuse to come down regularly. That's the kind of thing you want to shoot for. You want to shoot for you know, whether you're doing the, the, you know, third Thursday, you know, it's that, it's that alliteration event where you pick your night and you just do one night a month and you do it every single night all year long and it's all about changing the customer behavior. Um, I think one of the biggest things that you have an opportunity for is you're going to see a lot new, I think you're going to see some new retailers over the next two years come in. You've got the space for it. So... If you can start to set the stage using a strategic event so that you can start to readjust what those hours are. Um, everybody was really, really proud to announce that we're Wednesday through Sunday. Like We get it. We know people shop on the weekends. We're open to Saturday and Sunday. And it's like, well, that's good, but you're Wednesday, Thursday, Friday till five. So those people still, like, if they have jobs, you, your customers are all unemployed. Boy, like, what, we've got to figure out that way that we can slowly and incrementally start to wrap our arms around those 400 plus people that don't have an opportunity to shop with you at all during the week if you're only open from 10 to 5. On that point, evenings. We roll up the carpet from 5 o'clock. Yep. Do you have any insights or comments about trying to do more to attract people in the evening? Yeah, it's got to be a slow incremental change because um, if you try to be too aggressive and too fast, then you're either going to overpromise and under deliver and frustrate the customer, or you're going to overextend the merchant before the customers come along. So uh, that's why I was saying the, the what I call the third Thursday event, where it's like you start to extend your hours incrementally, and typically it's going to take you. A full three years to transition and even at the end of the three years you might have only achieved one night a week that you're staying open late but you're fighting an uphill battle because your competition is open until 9 and 10 or all night long online so um, you have to be very very deliberate and you've got to put up the appropriate barriers so you're not burning out your retailers while you're teaching the customers Consider us on Thursdays or consider us on, I, it's up to you as a merchant community to pick what day makes the most sense. But I do think that you need to start owning a night. You know, I think you need to own a weeknight. And 
Um, if all your restaurants and stuff are closed Monday and Tuesday, don't do it Monday or Tuesday. But, you know, typically in the South, you don't do it Wednesday. So that leaves Thursday and Friday, and their football games on Friday. So a lot of people like Thursday, you know. So, um, but again, that's that's completely. Okay. You might you said that during worship training that at home you said don't try uh, Friday night and do it for three months and say that's it. Right. You gotta do it longer. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's not the you make this assumption that the customers are just waiting with bated breath. To come in your store if you decide to stay open one extra hour, and it's like no, you're you're literally teaching them new habits. So um, it's kind of it's kind of like the adult version of potty training. Coming back to something you touched on at the beginning, uh, how significant is the potential of doing something about lodging or our lack of lodging? Well, lodging is really important. Um, the nature of lodging in smaller communities has changed dramatically with the with the evolution of Airbnb. Um, but Airbnb has also been extremely cannibalistic on communities where, you know, you could conceivably see that ownership rate change dramatically if all of a sudden speculators start to purchase up historic housing stock and use it for Airbnb. So um, I think that the idea of some sort of boutique style resident, I mean, lodging is a really, really valid one. We're seeing developers all across the country that are showing interest in small communities with interesting storylines. Um, we had a community in St. Paul, Virginia, can't be, can't be very much larger than you. Maybe they're 2,500, and they just had a boutique hotel come in. I think it's a 40 or 50 room hotel with a really nice restaurant and it's all catered at ATV uh, enthusiasts that are coming to the region to, to ride trails. So Whether it's a boutique hotel or a shop, you know, uh, do, should the town look at incentives? We've lost some wonderful little restaurants, the American, uh, to other towns that started here first. Well intention, but somebody said, "No, I insist that I get this much first." And yet, you know, you have to make reservations two weeks out now, and people travel thirty miles further. So, how do we get smarter about getting the kind of shops that you've indicated and the kind of boutique hotels you're suggesting? So the best so answer I can give you to that is incentives are a two-edged sword. If a if a potential business owner is coming in and they're demanding a certain incentive or they're going to walk, mm -hmm. to me, that makes a very clear statement that they don't have a passion to be in this community. Right. And right now, I want that passion. I want somebody who wants to be here. Now, that being said, does the town have a business-friendly environment? Does the process, is the process streamlined? We oftentimes dramatically misunderstand what kind of incentive it is. We think we got to give people money. Well, it's like, no, let a process take a month instead of taking nine months. Because that costs me money. Lots of money. You know, so are we good business partners? And are there places where we can assist while still maintaining that understanding of a desire to be here? You know, if a, if a developer ever says, give me incentive or I'm walking, I'm like, don't let because we're just not big enough to, to play that game. We, we, you need to want to be here. You, you owe it to the other businesses to want to be here. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that's, that's my gut. On it. Yes, Excuse me, I've got to go through yeah. my regulars. Hi, Hi. thank you. <laughs> How do you find these developers and investment people who would want to come here? We don't okay. Have Okay, so, so the way that you just asked that question is the way that most communities think. And so, so break it down for a second. How do we find them? Because they're hiding. They're not hiding. If somebody is a developer, they're always actively looking for projects. They're interested in projects. 
The problem is, in a community like this, with where you are right now, some of the developers that we're talking about probably are right here, right now, and don't realize. So the first thing that you have to adopt is that mindset of, hey, you know, we're completely and totally in favor of the mom and pop developer. And if your project is an $18.5 million dollar project, maybe that's too aggressive for a community that has the vacancy rate this year. You know what I mean? It's like, use that to help gauge what makes sense and what's right in your community. Um, but the other thing from a, from a business standpoint, I always think, go and think about these communities that surround us in the 30, 45 minute range. Think about business owners that are doing really great jobs and go have a conversation about have they ever considered a second location. You know, we heard the story all day long about the, um, the bicycle brew shop that bypassed Havana and went to Thomasville, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, they're set up in Thomasville now. They're making money. They've got a revenue stream. Doing good. Do they want a small footprint second location? They are interested. You know? So, I mean, those are, that's one of the best things is being able to identify the, the types of business owners that you want to have here by the kind of business because one of the things that we found is having that kind of personal conversation with them, it leaves an impression. Even if it doesn't lead to them having a location here, they will end up telling other people. Because guess what happens? When they sit there, and let's say they have somebody come in, or they come across somebody in a professional circle who's sitting there saying, I want to open a body shop. Well, I know Havana's interested. They're talking to me about it. Starts that kind of chain reaction, but um, there, there isn't like a there isn't like a secret developers club that I found, but I, there there are certain things where, like let's say you're going after a boutique hotel, there's a there's a woman who's doing all the development of boutique hotels in Virginia, and I would connect you with her and have you have a conversation with Kim. And then I would also have you talk to the person who developed the inn at the crossroads in Lake City, South Carolina. Uh, this is like a 6,000 person community with a 70 room boutique hotel in that town. Now that you've started talking to a couple people that have done what you want done, you now might know what kind of people you need to be talking to. Does that make sense? You, it's, well, I know we've done it on a smaller because I know Tony and Perry went to a restaurant that was mm -hmm. lunch. I mean, that definitely is, in theory, that is one of the benefits of this community now having the Main Street model, is when you get when you get together with Main Streets across Florida, you're now going to be connected with people that might be doing similar projects. So there should be that kind of shared connection and shared network. Tony, who's in, who's in Apalachicola? You have to contact. They don't have a Main Street. Um, 